So what are you holding on to? Uh, who are you holding on to in the challenges of life? Jennifer was 17 years of age. She had nothing to hold on to because she had no worldview that included God. She lived in a lavish home in the hills of Saratoga. Her two sisters were very bright students. Her, not so much. Her ethnic background, her lack of communication skills, her small stature, coupled with her parents' over-the-top educational expectations, they just wore on her. She did not measure up with her classmates, and she didn't measure up in her family. But she longed to fit in, and finally she did, but with the wrong crowd. She got involved in drugs, the occult, and seeking the attention she never, ever had from her dad, she found herself pregnant. Her guilt, her shame began to push her over the edge. She got an abortion. Unbeknown to her parents, thoughts of helplessness and hopelessness began to gain a toehold, became a stronghold in her life. She was insecure. She felt unloved. She had all kinds of regrets, and she decided on a plan to end her life, which she followed through on. In 2022, 50,000 people in this, the United States of America, took their lives. 39,000 of them were males, mostly, I think, 32,000 white males. 20% of teenagers have thought about suicide. You talk about overcoming life's challenges. You have them, I have them. If you don't think you do, you got your head in the sand uh, somewhere. They come in various shapes and various forms in our life. You could name those that, are, are, that you struggle with, but they're moral and ethical. Or, you know, you have to file your taxes soon. Uh, I'm sure you're all upright citizens paying the government just exactly what they need and deserve. There are material things. There's the grappling and the lust for, for stuff, for things, the gloss, the glitter, and so forth of this world in which we live in. Uh, then there's personal. There's the, the desire for status and for power and to, to be somebody in this world. They're relational, the struggles that we have in our marriages, in our families, in our churches. They're sensual. And they're sexual because God made us sexual creatures as well. And of course, they are very, very spiritual as well. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who lived his life and gave up his life because of his stance against Hitler and the German, said this, in our members, listen to this carefully, especially you young people, but it doesn't just apply to young people. It doesn't matter what age and stage of life. There's a slumbering inclination towards desire, which is both sudden and fierce. With irresistible power, desire seizes mastery over the flesh. All at once, the secret smoldering fire is kindled. The flesh burns and is in flames. And he goes on and he adds this. It makes no difference whether it's sexual desire or ambition or vanity or desire for revenge or love of fame and power or greed for money. Finally, that strange desire for the beauty of the world of nature. Joy in God, it's extinguished in us at that particular point, and we seek our joy in the creature. At this moment, God is quite unreal to us. He loses all reality. Only desire for the creature is real. The only reality is the devil. Satan does not fill us with hatred of God, but, listen, with forgetfulness of God. 
The lust thus aroused envelops the mind, the will of man, woman, in deepest darkness, and the powers of clear discrimination and of decision are taken from us. It is here that everything within me rises up against the word of God. I can guarantee you, you cannot handle the temptations without the word of God. How did Joseph overcome? And we looked last week at some of the kind of categories that he faced. But how did he face betrayal? How did he face false accusations against him and, and the lies? Well, there are a plethora of them. Let me just mention a few. First of all, he knew his master. If you've got your Bible handy, you can open it up there to Genesis chapter 39. We're going to look at this in just a moment at a little greater depth when we talk about how he faced these sexual temptations. But he had something that was someone who was premier in his life, and that was his God, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the God now of Joseph. Same God, same promises, same covenant. And it's the same God that you can trust with whatever challenge or issue or temptation that you are facing in life. You see, the first duty of every person is to discover who you're going to serve. Jesus put it quite clearly, no man can serve two masters. It's an impossibility. You cannot serve God and money or anything else. Joseph had a relationship with, with his God. He knew his master, and he understood something about spiritual warfare. Remember when... His brothers were there. I shared this last week. As for you, brothers, you all meant evil against me. God meant it for good. Evil. All evil comes from this one in Genesis chapter 3 that tempted Eve with this. Has God said? Yes, he has. And you need to know what he says. And you parents, you need to teach your children what the word of God says. Otherwise, they cannot compete with their media. No, he understood the enemy who wants to kill and steal and destroy. If you know anything about Ephesians chapter 6, our women just went through it in Bible study. Our struggle is not against one another. It's against powers, rulers, spiritual forces of notice, wickedness in the heavenly places, in the unseen realms. That's why you need to be strong in the Lord, and I do at my age, in the strength of his might. And if I don't put on the full armor of God, I'll become a victim rather than a victor. Thus, you need to know your identity of who you are, that you're a child of God and that he loves you. Oh, he loves me so, as we were just singing about. Are you viewing your life vertically, or is everything just on the horizontal plane? If all you think about and you can try to manage life on a horizontal plane, you're in big trouble. We just finished singing, oh, God, my God, I need you. What do you need him for? Is he real to you? When the temptations come and they're so strong? No, he viewed life vertically. In chapter 41, I think he uses God's name nine times. How did, you, how did you understand these dreams? It was God. It was God. It was God who has directed me. There's a God in heaven who can answer your dream, Pharaoh. And he refused revenge and self pity. Isaiah uh, chapter 45, verse 2 of Genesis. Says, says this. Well, verse 40, verse 1 says, Then Joseph could not control himself before all those who stood by him. These are his brothers. And he cried 
have everyone get out away from here. So there was no man with him, and Joseph made himself known to his brothers, and he wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard it, and the household of Pharaoh heard it. These ten brothers who threw him in the pit, who wanted to kill him, who wanted to erase his name from the family tree, so to speak, he did not have revenge for. And throughout from 37 to 50, you find Joseph not wallowing any way, shape, or form in self-pity. You do not find him wallowing in, oh, I should be entitled to this or that. No, no. He took a stand with his God, the one who stood beside him. And he persevered in all of this in hope. Very few things are accomplished without perseverance. I started playing the game of basketball at seven. I shoveled snow on, away from the corn crib where my dad had erected a hoop. I would shovel it so I could shoot. And I started shooting and shooting and shooting. And when it rained, it did not matter if the ball wouldn't bounce. I still shot. You persevere in whatever it is in, in hope. God has something better at the end of the day. And Joseph could look back and he could say that in chapter 40, verse 23. After he's in prison and the cupbearer and the baker forget all about him, it says the cupbearer did not remember Joseph but forgot him. So what, is he, what do you do when it doesn't seem like plans are coming together and God's not there? You persevere in hope. Having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And not only that, but we persevere. Perseverance brings about proven character. And proven character, hope. Because hope does not disappoint. Because the Holy Spirit, the love of God has been shed abroad in our hearts who was given to you and to me. And amidst all of this, Joseph could see the hand of God. You may not be able to see the hand of God working right now. For many of us that are older, we can look back in our lives in the rearview mirror and we can see God's hand guiding and directing, sometimes when we weren't even seeking him. And Joseph saw these kind of things as opportunities. He was in prison. He was so faithful he had such a mind to figure things out. He ran the whole prison after a while. Remember, from 17, he didn't come in power till, till he was 30. There were 13 long years. Much of that was spent in prison. And he saw it as an opportunity. And the, the chief jailer there, he, he didn't care anything about what happened in prison. He entrusted everything to Joseph because Joseph was a trustworthy man. He saw them as opportunities. And Joseph knew his God as the guns who gives dreams, the one who is working to fulfill those dreams and will fulfill them in the end. He's the author of your faith. You didn't think it up. And he's going to be the finisher of your faith. And so we, our part is to fix our eyes on Jesus who is the author and perfecter. And he did it for the joy that was set before him. He endured the cross. He despised the shame. He sat down at the right hand of God, a perfect, completed work. That's where he is today, and his present ministry is praying for people like you and me that are weak in and of ourselves. And the weaker you are, the more he will come to your aid He's opposed to the proud, and he gives grace to the humble. And that's why we preach Christ. That's why Joseph relied on his God. Dietrich Bonhoeffer went on to say this, cheap grace is preaching forgiveness without repentance. It is baptism without the discipline of community. It is the Lord's Supper without confession of sin. Cheap grace is grace without discipleship, grace without the cross, grace without the living incarnate Jesus Christ. We go through sometimes, don't we, the motions. Instead of crying out to God, 
One of the secrets in the Christian life is crying out to God. Oh, God, I need you. Save me. Save me from myself. Save me from my flesh. Save me from the, the missiles of the enemy. No, we come to him. In chapter 39, we have this account of what took place after he got into Potiphar's house. Remember, he's a slave. He has to learn the language. He has to learn the customs. And he comes into Pharaoh's, or uh, into Potiphar's uh, house, and we don't know how long he was there before Potiphar realized that this, this guy, this guy has some ingenuity, this guy has some fortitude, this guy has some resilience, this guy has, a, 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 well, he's a faithful guy. And he put him in charge of everything in his house. And Potiphar was just, he wasn't a nobody, he was somebody. And he puts everything in his house. Servants, we don't know how many there were there, but he understood the nature of sin. He understood the nature, the pull of the flesh. And so if you look at verse 8 of chapter 39, it says this, because Potiphar's wife, she had a plan too. Joseph was very, very handsome in form and appearance, the Scriptures tell us. And she wanted him. And so she devised a plan as to how she was going to do it. We don't know how she dressed. We don't know exactly what she said. But all we do know is that day after day after day, Potiphar's wife was there trying to entice Joseph. Verse 8 says, But he refused and said to his master's wife, Behold, with me here, my master does not concern himself with anything in the house, and he's put all that he owns in my charge. Verse 9, There is no one greater in the house than I, and he has withheld nothing from me except you, because you are his wife. How then could I do this great evil and sin against God. Remember, all sin is against God. And she spoke to Joseph day after day after day, and he did not listen to her to lie beside her or be with her. That was his strategy. How could I do this and sin against my God is because the only giant in Joseph's life was God. And he understood that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. It's not the final thing. It's the beginning. Fearing God. Honoring God. Respecting God. Bowing before Him. He feared the Lord. And He made no provision for the flesh. Would you be willing to hand me your, your iPhones, your smartphones, and let me look over where you've been the last week, the last 10 days? or what you've watched on YouTubes or movies or this or that or whatever. You see, we, we somehow sometimes make provision for different kinds of things. I, I have, um, I've got a, if I can find it here, I've got a little story uh, about, um, <laughs> about a boy. I grew up on a farm. We had a river that ran through our little farm called the Cobb River. And one day, a, f a f father said to his son, Now, son, don't swim in the river. Okay, Dad? When he came home carrying a wet bathing suit that evening, though, <laughs> where you been? Well, I've been swimming in a river. Didn't I tell you not to swim there? Yes, sir. Why did you? Well, that, it kind of went like this. I had my bathing suit with me, and I couldn't resist the temptation. Why did you take your bathing suit with you, he questioned, so I'd be prepared to swim in case I was tempted. <laughs> <laughs> now, we laugh, but we make provision for things, okay? No, be wise as a serpent and harmless 
as a dove. Joseph made no provision in regard to the flesh. He was passionate about purity because he was looking to the reward. He knew and understood way back then that God rewards faithfulness. And as we've been going through Hebrews chapter 11, huh? Remember verse 6? Without faith it is impossible to please God. For the one who comes to God must believe that he is, that he exists, and that he is the rewarder of those who diligently seek him. The reward comes at the end of the race. That's why we want to finish strong. I'm 80. I'm just getting started. That's when Moses got started, by the way, at, at 80. So, you know, he lived to 120. So, no, I don't think I have 40 years left. I don't even know about tomorrow. But, but I want to continue in my life to, to grow. The reward comes at the end. Paul says, I fought the good fight. I finished the course. I've kept the faith. You need to keep the faith in the midst of the challenges and the trials, the loneliness of life, wherever you might be. You can be in a marriage and be as so, so lonely. Or in a family and not feel like you're fitting in whatsoever. Or you're at school and you just don't fit in with the rest of the crowd. That's okay, but it's a hard place. He was looking to the reward, and God rewarded him in the prison. Jailer didn't have to worry about this guy. Jerry Bridges, in one of his books, says this, Do you make it your goal not to sin or not to sin very much? Hello. I missed more shots than I made. I've been on 18 teams all over the world sharing Christ th through sports. I've played hundreds of games. I don't intend to miss, but I miss. I don't intend to do it. Sometimes, though, we make intentions. Someone said the road to hell is paved with good intentions. We don't follow through. We should make it our goal not to sin. And when we do stumble and fall, and we all do, then we repent. It means to come back. It means to change. It means to go in a different direction. It means to have a strategy that you have to. In the 30 years I coached, I always had a game plan. It didn't always work, but I had a game plan against the particular team that I was coaching against because I had scouted them out. Before I took our ball team to Zimbabwe, I watched the year before we got invited the national team play. I, I drove many miles just to watch them play, so I knew what kind of team I needed to beat them. So I got a couple of players. I got a shooting guard from Stanford University to play with our, our college team and, and a, a forward six, eight or six, nine from San Jose State. And then I had the players that, that I had. You have a strategy. You lay it out. Joseph knew how to handle temptation. You got to have a game plan. Potiphar's wife had a game plan. Didn't work, but she had one. And we need to have a game plan on how we can stand firm against, as I mentioned before, all the flaming missiles of the evil one. Susanna Wesley, who raised, uh, well, I think she had 18 children. She, she, by the way, was the last of 27 in her family. And Susanna Wesley said this, whatever weakens your reason... See, the mind is a key thing in the, in the Christian life. Uh, this morning, I looked up, gird your minds for action. Be prepared in season, out of season. Whatever impairs the tenderness of your conscience. You see, the Holy Spirit will help you in these areas if we would just but listen to him. Look out. Obscures your sight of God. Takes from you your thirst for spiritual thing or increases the authority of your body over the mind, then that thing, whatever that might be to you, is evil. 
And by this test, you may detect evil no matter how subtly or how plausibly temptation may be presentable to you. The, thing, the one who knows the right thing to do and does not do it, to him it is sin. There are some things that I can't do. To me, it would be sin. We're not to go around judging one another and looking at one another and comparing one another and all that. We're to watch over our own hearts with all diligence because out of your heart flow the abundance of life, the decisions of life. You make all of your decisions based on your beliefs and values and conviction, bar none. It's a battle. It's a fight to the very end. So I ask you a question. Are you living your life for the audience of one? I had in my weekly uh, email <clears throat> a couple of verses that had to do with God's all-seeing eye. Jeremiah says, Can a man, a woman, a boy, or a girl hide himself in hiding places so I do not see him? When you're on your phone, you're on your device, or, or I am, doesn't matter where you are, at school, at work, at the gym, can a man, a woman, hide himself in hiding places so I do not see him, declares the Lord? Do I not fill the heavens and the earth, declares the Lord? David in Psalm 139 said, where can I go? If I go to the mountains, he's there. If I go to the depths of the sea, bottom there, he's there. Wherever I go, live your life, as Brother Lawrence said, in the presence of God. If you're doing dishes, if you're mopping the floor, if you're working 60 hours a week at your job, whatever you do in word or deed, do it for the glory of God, for the audience, for the clap of him. God's clap. And the only way you're going to do it <clears throat> is because if you just feed your mind on the stuff of this world, I can guarantee you where you're going to be. You're going to end up like Joseph in the pit. Or you're going to end up with chains like he was in prison. And that is the goal of the evil one. He comes to kill and steal and destroy. He's no respecter of persons. Children, it does not matter. You shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Fill your mind with truth. Listen to the scriptures. When you're in the car, whatever, when you take walks, not all the time. You don't have to feel guilty if you don't. Sometimes you just need to let down a little bit. But, but you have to let the word of God richly dwell within you. That's why we as Christians are to speak to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing, making melody in our hearts to the Lord. Uh, he wants us to fall in love with him at deeper and deeper and deeper levels and to trust him. You see, I'm convinced that the world needs people like Joseph. Men and women, boys and girls who cannot be bought, who keep their word no matter what, who put character above power and position, who will not give up when there's adversity, who are larger than their vocations, who do not hesitate to take risks, who do not lose their identity in a crowd, who will be honest in small things as great things, who make no compromise with evil, whose ambitions are not confined to their own selfish desires, who look out for the interests of others before their own, who will not back away from a fight, who will not close a blind eye to injustice, who lets their yes be yes and their no, no, and who know that there is salvation in no other name other than the name of Jesus and that God is in control and working in your life to will and to work for his good pleasure. When you leave today, uh, if you like, you could pick up, the, I made about 100 copies. <clears throat> I, 50 years ago when I became a believer, 
Well, I had some major struggles in lots of areas in my life. I've heard me share my testimony. But I needed a strategy. This is called a strategy for the war with the flesh and the world and the devil. These are verses that I, I put into my mind and into my heart. I'll read a few. Uh, first of all, you need to remember that the, the war is, is real. That's Galatians 5.17. The flesh wars against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. They're contrary. You need to cultivate the fear of the Lord. I already shared that with you, Proverbs 9.10. The fear of the Lord is beginning the wisdom and knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. If you want to do battle against the world, the flesh, and the devil, you need to develop your relationship with Christ. Oh, that I might know him in the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death. Philippians chapter 3. You need to learn how to draw near to God in humility. Where James says, cleanse your hands, you sinners, purify your hearts, you double-minded, be miserable and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be torn, the joy, your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves under the hand of God, and he will exalt you. Know your identity. Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who you have from God? You're not your own. You've been bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body, which is his. Walk in the Spirit, Galatians 5, 16, and you won't carry out the desires of the flesh. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he's near. Make a commitment to purity like Joseph did. How could I do this and sin against my God? You need to learn how to erase and replace. That's Romans chapter 12, verse 2. I urge you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, well, that's one, to present your bodies a living sacrifice. Do not be conformed to this world. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may know what the will of God is. So I could go on. There's about 15 more in there. But you need to fortify your mind. You need to set your mind on things above, not on things on earth. For your life is hidden with Christ in God. Colossians chapter 3 says. And when Christ is revealed, you and I are going to be revealed with him in glory. What a hope, what a future that we have. That's why we keep our minds set at the finish line. Don't you know that those who run the race all one run, but only one receives a prize? Run in such a way that you may win. No one ever lines up preparing to lose. Pat and I were invited to a home of someone, a couple that's fairly new to our church. And while we were having a lovely dinner, we started talking about various kinds of things. And, and uh, well, they both love to exercise. Uh, the gal uh, has run, I don't know how many marathons. I, I think she ran one when she was six months pregnant. How did that? I have no idea. But run. You run with endurance the race that is set before you. Fixing your eyes on the Savior. You have to fix your eyes straight ahead. If you look to the left or to the right in a race, they'll bypass you. I want you to win. You all struggle like I struggle. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. Don't tell me that they don't knock on your door every day. They do. And that's why we need to put on the full armor of God, and that's why we need each other. When you talk about uh, what men face today, this... This book I shared with you in my weekly email, Men's Secret Wars. Men are fighting secret wars against workaholism, sexual addictions, substance abuse, pornography, extramarital affairs, and on and on and on. Of course, women have no secret wars. You women are all water walkers. I just am so thankful for all of you. No, 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 no. Now, why do women watch soap operas, read romance novels, and uh, fantasize about this or that? No, we all struggle in many 
ways. But don't keep any secrets from God. That's freeing. I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray with my eyes wide open for you and for me. Lord, we all face challenges, every single one of us here. The children that are with us, the middle schoolers, the high schoolers, the young adults, the college aged, the middle aged, and those of us that are senior citizens. And you know well that we all struggle. And help us to cry out in our time of need. Help us, Lord, all of us to know where we struggle, to identify that, and to help us make no provision. And if we need help to go to someone in the body of Christ that can help us, who seems a little bit further down the line, who's maybe been overcome and conquered some things that we feel so, well, like they're going to, we're going to drown. There's a verse of Scripture before we sing this last song. Uh, the song is, is, is he worthy? You and I aren't worthy to come into his presence on our own. We cannot even enter the holy place except by the blood of Christ, but we come and we come in repentance. If you have something in your heart and life today that's keeping you between, you know, gotten a wedge there, name it. Call out to God for your help. And he's the only one who is worthy Flip that other slide back up, uh, Jonathan, the one we just had there. It says in Revelation, they sang a new song saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to break its seals, for you were, notice this, this is about Jesus, were slaughtered. And you purchased people for God with your blood from every tribe and language and people and nation. Look around you. We got the nations right here. And you have made them into a kingdom and priest to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. Our future is as bright as the promises of God. And in the book of Revelation chapter 5, they, 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 they sang a new song. Worthy are you, O Lord, to receive glory and blessing and honor. He is worthy for you and I to live our lives for his Glory. So I ask you to, to stand to your feet, and uh, we've sung this song, I think, here once before. <clears throat> uh, sing <clears throat> with us in worship. <clears throat>